In the autumn of 1519, the Aztec King Moctezuma nervously watched as heavily armed, light-skinned men wandered through the streets of his capital city. For the first time in their history, the Aztecs had encountered an enemy more powerful than themselves. Proud of itself is the city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan. Here no one fears to die in war. This is our glory. Who could conquer Tenochtitlan? Who could shake the foundation of heaven? Aztec Paul. Despite his status as an Aztec god, Cortes was taking no chances. To protect himself, the Spanish captain took Moctezuma as a virtual hostage in his own city, turning the mighty king into little more than a puppet ruler. The king was, must have been very, very scared. And uh, that is, of course, the relation, because he immediately wants to have an alliance. And Cortes says, well, uh, we'll have an alliance, but you're going to recognize that the big boss is the Spanish king. And the guy says, so, you know, poor, poor, who the hell was the Spanish king? Nobody knew at that point, in, not in Mexico. So he has to accept it or else he's got a very powerful enemy, and that's the relation. Not only did Moctezuma cooperate with the Spaniards, he personally led them to his treasury. It was a discovery beyond their wildest dreams. Since the Aztec Empire had accumulated over hundreds of years a lot of gold because they were getting taxes and they were just storing them in a room. So whenever the Span when the Spanish saw that room, they just their, their ears fell off because it was a room full of gold. In the spring of 1520, a new force of 800 Spaniards and 18 ships arrived at Veracruz. They were dispatched by the Cuban governor to track down Cortes and hang him for treason. When Cortes learned of their arrival, he knew he had to take decisive action. He left a contingent behind to keep an eye on Moctezuma and then marched 150 miles back to the coast to confront them. Cortes attacked suddenly in the middle of a rainy night, surprising and overrunning the enemy camp. In the morning, he spoke to the men who had come to kill him and convinced them to join him instead. Cortes promised them a share in the enormous riches of the Aztec Empire. But in his absence, tensions in the Aztec capital exploded. In the midst of a festival to celebrate the war god, the Spaniards impetuously attacked to prevent human sacrifice, which Cortes had banned. They brutally slayed dancers and priests engaged in worship. Cortes's men then turned on unarmed spectators. Every Aztec temple was ransacked. As many as 3,000 Indians were killed. The festival massacre turned the Aztecs against Moctezuma, who they now associated with the Spanish. When Cortes and his men returned from the coast, they entered a city ready to explode. As Aztec warriors stormed the palace, Moctezuma climbed atop the wall, imploring his people to stop fighting. But Moctezuma could no longer control his subjects. They shouted insults at him in their fury and cried, Who is Moctezuma to give us orders? We are no longer his slaves. They shouted war cries and fired arrows at the rooftop. The Codex Florentino. Moctezuma was struck down by stone hurled from the angry mob, killed by his own people. With his ally gone and the Aztec military in control of the city, Cortes decided to retreat. Under cover of night, he led a thousand Spanish soldiers and his Indian allies out of the city. Cortes ordered all the gold and jewels and silver brought out they loaded men and animals alive with as much as they could carry. Bernal Diaz. Cortes and his men moved silently as they tried to exit the city, carrying the plunder of Moctezuma's treasury on their backs. Then suddenly, thousands of Aztecs attacked. The Spanish fought fiercely along the causeway, 
leaping into the water when they came to the canals. Many drowned under the weight of Moctezuma's gold. The battle was incredible. Hundreds of Spaniards fell. The night would forever be remembered as La Noche Triste, the sad night. As the story goes, you know, there's these tremendous treasures uh, and these guys are fighting uh, down the causeway to get out and they try to swim with all this weight and so f therefore they can't swim with, uh, with all this um, uh, jewelry on them and, and they drown and good riddance because they weren't good people. Anyway, uh, a number of people do finally escape. Pursued into the nearby hills, Cortez was surrounded and hugely outnumbered his men weary to the point of collapse. They were on the verge of absolute defeat when Cortes charged through the enemy lines on horseback and personally killed an Aztec chieftain in front of his warriors. The slaying so demoralized the Aztecs that they withdrew, allowing Cortes to escape. The Spaniards went back to Tlaxcala to heal their wounds. The following spring, Cortes launched another onslaught against Tenochtitlan. It was a city far weaker than it had been when the Spaniards arrived 18 months before. Smallpox, a European disease to which the Aztecs had no resistance had devastated the population. A great plague broke out in Tenochtitlan, striking everywhere in the city. The illness was so dreadful that no one could walk or move. A great many died from this plague, and many others died of hunger. The Codex Florentino. Moctezuma's successor was among the dead. He was then succeeded by Moctezuma's nephew, Cuauhtémoc. Prophetically, his name meant Falling Eagle. While the warriors of Tenochtitlan were far weaker than before, Cortés was far stronger. Capitalizing on the hatred neighboring tribes had for the Aztecs, Cortés raised an army of nearly 100,000, all of them eager to attack the Aztec capital. There would be no repeat of La Noche Triste. The fighting raged for weeks as the Aztecs fought desperately. It was house by house and street by street, brutal and grisly. As the battle raged, the Aztecs sacrificed 66 captured Spaniards atop the Great Pyramid plucking out their hearts in plain sight of their comrades below. It was terrifying when we looked up at the top of the tall temple. They sacrificed all our men, eating their arms and legs and offering their hearts and blood to their idols. Bernal Diaz. The battle raged on, but the Aztecs were outmatched by the weapons and tactics of the conquistadors. When the Europeans came over and fought the Aztecs, not only did they have the great military advantage of having swords and cannons and, and uh, gunpowder, but they think of the psychological aspect of it, that here they were on horses and a, ho a soldier on a horse could just trample over four or five or ten Aztecs that were on foot. So it was a uh, really a real David and Goliath situation when the Europeans uh, met um, the Aztec warriors. The Spaniards were too powerful. They had advanced technology. They had horses. Uh, they were not going to be denied this prize. In the end, the magnificent city of Tenochtitlan fell into rubble before the sword and cannon of the conquistadors. Cuauhtémoc was captured and brought before Cortés. The last king of the Aztecs was proud and defiant to the end. Said Cuauhtémoc, I have assuredly done my duty in defense of my city and my vassals, and can do no more. Take the dagger that you have in your belt, and strike me dead immediately. Bernal Diaz. Cuauhtémoc would die after four years in captivity, finally hanged by Cortés for rebellion. 
the Aztec Empire and city of Tenochtitlan died with him. The Spanish conquest was complete. There's a real ambivalence about the, the, the conquest, about the Spaniards. Uh, on the one hand, it's a way of looking to Europe, and it's a connection to Europe, and it's a way of, uh, the way we do on this continent, we, we tend to legitimize ourselves by looking uh, to Europe, uh, especially Western Europe. Uh, on the other hand, they are, um, you know, they are the imperialists. They, they came and, uh, and uh, raped and pillaged and took over the country and, and, and killed uh, many, many uh, Mexicans in the process, Mexican Indians in the process. So um, there's a big division there. From the ruins of the Aztec Empire, would emerge a new and often troubled civilization.